Shuttle Endeavour on an ambitious mission to service the Hubble Space Telescope. We finally flew uh, STS-61, which was the first Hubble servicing mission. Absolutely incredible mission. Well, clearly we have a dynamic situation. You cannot take the 84-inch mirror out of the telescope. It's part of structure, too big, it's there. So by putting in one box called CoStar, and we're able to correct aberrant light for five other instruments. Of all the space shuttle missions we've flown, it was without a doubt the most ambitious flight, but the one that I think demonstrated NASA's uh, can-do attitude, its technological skill, its technical capability, and the spirit of its people. Two teams of astronauts made a record five back-to-back -back spacewalks to refurbish Hubble and realize her potential to awe and astound. While Hubble servicing missions were very important, the true gift of a maneuverable shuttle was soon realized in a very different rescue mission. Booster ignition and liftoff of the maiden voyage of Endeavour on a satellite rescue mission. Months earlier, in May of 1992, the seven astronauts of SDS-49 overcame initial setbacks to pluck the $180 million Intel Sat-6 communication satellite from an unusable orbit. It was going to be a very simple rendezvous, you know, get close, bring the satellite down close and grapple it with the remote manipulator system. Everything that could go wrong went wrong. We got up there to capture it, uh, the, uh, the bar, we tapped the satellite and the, and the, with the bar and the satellite started uh, moving out of control. Get me in, pitch me over. Into the arm, watch the arm. Oh, that's a cigarette again. You're going to have to get out of there. It can be very difficult catching something like a tumbling satellite in space. The slightest touch or mistouch by the astronaut with the equipment, and you can send that satellite tumbling. Yeah, make sure that when you want me to yaw right, you say yaw right. Okay. And any other time right, it's just right. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. Better okay. move. We're moving. And so it was very touch and go on that mission, actually. Commander Dan Branistein and pilot Kevin Chilton are preparing for the upcoming terminal initiate burn. After several days of failed attempts with Endeavour's remote arm, Commander Dan Brandenstein literally tries a new approach. Yeah, real easy, guys. Real easy. Don't bring us any closer, Dan. Okay, I'm stopping it. At Endeavour's helm, Brandenstein delicately maneuvers the orbiter up to the four and a half ton Intel Sat 6. The satellite is, is rolling out of control in three different axes at once, and you could actually fire the shuttle and, and fly this maneuver around and keep it aligned with it. Three people grabbed 18,000 pounds. Aware that any miscue could endanger not only the satellite but also the ride home, spacewalkers Pierre Thuot, Tom Akers, and Rick Heap reach out and secure the satellite by hand. Okay. Wait, wait. Yeah, nice job, guys. Intel Sat 6 is released from the cargo bay with a new mini rocket motor for a gentle push to its proper orbit, where it remains today fully functional. And as the shuttle program matured, so it seemed did relationships between the world's spacefaring nations. On STS-47, the 50th Space Shuttle mission saw the orbiter Endeavour back in space on September 12, 1992. The mission was a cooperative space lab venture between Japan and the United States that brought the first Japanese astronaut into orbit as a member of the seven-person shuttle crew. The Space Shuttle has launched people from different nations around this world that used to feel they could never, ever work together and it has ushered us from the Cold War to this really cooperative space program that we have with our international partners, including the former Soviet Union. Regardless of what language you speak, 
you speak in a lot of space. And that's pretty cool. Uh, people, we have a lot in common with uh, engineers and scientists around the world, and that's kind of fun to work in a program like this. On February 3rd, 1995, Eileen Collins, the first woman to pilot a shuttle, was at the helm as Discovery gave the U.S. its first up-close look at the Mir space station. Collins flew the shuttle through a series of intricate maneuvers, approaching within 37 feet of the Russian spacecraft and, later, performing a fly-around by hand. And liftoff of the space shuttle Atlantis on a mission that will herald a new day of international cooperation in space. Four months later, on June 27, 1995, Shuttle Atlantis would lift off from the Kennedy Space Center to begin STS-71, the U.S. space program's 100th human space mission. It would take two more days before Atlantis caught up with and performed the first shuttle docking with the Mir space station. Houston, Atlantis, we have captured. Orbiting 220 miles above the Earth, a most unique and historic celebration took place. as the Mir space station welcomed its first American guests, cosmonauts and astronauts, together broke figurative bread, tortillas and fruit to be exact, in a renewed spirit of cooperation. Together, Shuttle and Mir formed the largest flying spacecraft the world had yet to see. It tipped the scales at 250 metric tons, more than a half a million pounds. Between 1994 and 98, the Shuttle Mir program would involve 11 shuttle missions, including in 1996, STS-76, which began a continuous U.S. presence aboard the Russian space station with a visit by Atlantis. Barely fluent in Russian, astronaut Shannon Lucid, a biochemist, embarked upon a mission that would dramatically enhance our understanding of life in space. When she finally landed at Edwards Air Force Base, on Shuttle Atlantis, she held the female space endurance record for spending 188 days in orbit. A hero's welcome was in store. I'm here to say welcome home to Shannon Lucid. By the time Shuttle Mir ended with SDS-91, seven American astronauts had completed extended stays aboard the Russian space station. Tatiana Mativa, who I became very good friends with, and. I remember us sitting in Red Square having dinner together with a full moon and remembering when I was a child all those, um, those parades, those May Day parades with the tanks going by. And here we were sitting there having a nice dinner under the full moon and with a lot of friendship. So it just goes to show how space can un unite people and uh, that's one of, I think, one of the biggest benefits. Eight cosmonauts had flown to Mir on the U.S. shuttle and NASA astronaut Norm Thagard had become the first American to fly there, or anywhere, aboard a Soyuz spacecraft. In 2001, 15 years after its commissioning, Mir would be abandoned to break up and burn in Earth's atmosphere. By then, the process of building upon Mir's legacy of international cooperation in space had already begun. Whereas STS-61 had helped establish the Hubble Space Telescope as an icon of American ingenuity, STS-95 would update the hero's credentials of one John Glenn. On October 29, 1998, almost 37 years after becoming the first American to orbit the Earth as an original Mercury 7 astronaut, Glenn, now a 77-year-old former U.S. Senator, made his return to space. In contrast to his first flight, a three-orbit, four-and-a-half-hour foray inside the snug Friendship 7 capsule, the liftoff of Discovery with a crew of six astronaut heroes and one American legend. STS-95 would take eight days and circle the Earth 134 times. My main reason for being on that shuttle flight was to do research on aging. I was 77, we went up and, you know, NASA has charted some 52 different th uh, changes that occur in the human body when you go into space for a period of time. 
And the several of those are very similar to what happens to the natural process of aging right here on Earth. Uh, body's immune system changes. You get less resistant to disease and infection. Uh, body's ability to absorb protein back into the muscles changes for the young people up there and for elderly here on Earth. Uh, the objective was to take those things that are the same and see if we couldn't find any differences between my experience up there and their younger and the younger people I would fly with with the idea of finding in the human body what turns these different systems on and off. If we could do that we might be able to make it possible for people to stay in space longer uh, without harmful effects and maybe cut out some of the frailties of old age right here on earth. I really was happy to be, be assigned to that flight. In an interesting twist of fate, astronaut Glenn not only inspired both the young and old around the globe, but also a fresh political science and economics graduate, Laurie Garver, the 18th Deputy Administrator of NASA. Having the ability at NASA to fly him again in space after his first flight was something we, I think, gave the nation, and it really helped explain what we were doing on the space shuttle. John Glenn was very, very focused on doing that exper those experiments for both, uh, I think, the older generation, but he was also an inspiration uh, to people growing up. Discovery carried a variety of payloads and research experiments. Arguably, the one most valuable was Glenn himself. Not only did he provide first-time data on what spaceflight might do to the body of a septuagenarian, Glenn also renewed the interest of the nation and the world in America's space shuttle program. While the program had and continued to successfully deploy and service science probes and satellites, as well as conduct on-orbit research, the space shuttle undertook a new, long-range task, perfectly suited to her specialized capabilities. You've got a spacecraft that can carry at least seven people into orbit, and with those seven people, you can do a huge amount of work. One mission, you can do multiple EVAs, you've got multiple crew members, you've got a huge payload, uh, just all kinds of capabilities to be able to construct and build bigger things in orbit. Less than two weeks after the Glenn's return to Earth, a Russian proton rocket departs the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan, carrying the Zarya module, the first component of the new International Space Station. Liftoff of the proton rocket and the Zarya control module, the International Space Station is underway. Two weeks after that, Space Shuttle Endeavour follows up with delivery of America's Unity Module, the second piece of this largest space station puzzle ever to be constructed. Houston Endeavour, we have capture of Zarya. Not until July 2000 will the Russian Zvezda Module be added, finally allowing for two Russian cosmonauts and their American Expedition One commander, Bill Shepard, to journey aboard a Soyuz spacecraft to the International Space Station and begin humankind's continuous extraterrestrial presence. Across the world, people are very, very interested in and delighted by the International Space Station and the science that has taken place there. Since only an orbiter's payload bay could hold the station's largest components, the multi-year multi-mission building, outfitting, and servicing of the ISS with cargo and crew would become primarily a job for the shuttle. Amid these dynamic station building missions, one seemingly simple and relatively uncomplicated flight would prove problematic and threaten the very future of America's human spaceflight program. Since 1988, the Space Shuttle had completed 15 years of successful missions. Each was unique, each had its own specific goals and tasks, and each had its own dedicated crew of astronauts who'd trained exhaustively to meet and carry them out. Yet each of those 87 flights did have two things in common. A safe launch. Lift off of the Space Shuttle Discovery. And a safe landing. Nose gear touchdown. From the start, STS-107 seemed to be a mission out of sorts. By the time Columbia was finally ready to fly on January 16, 2003, its planned 16-day mission had been delayed no fewer than 18 times. 
All those delays had ultimately positioned the STS-107 as a sort of black sheep on the space shuttle program's launch schedule.